Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Don Murray, senior editor with Venues Now magazine. We're going to talk social distance design today on our one on one Venues Now sessions. I've got Jonathan Cole from Pendulum Studio in Kansas City and Chris Lamberth from TBS Design in beautiful Los Angeles, California. So thanks, gentlemen, for joining me today. I appreciate it. How are you both doing? Great. Thank you for having us. Yeah, great. Good to see you, JC. Well, you guys, um, I, I always enjoy talking with both of you because you both have um, interesting ideas and kind of think um, outside of the box, um, even though that's become kind of a cliche these days. But um, let's talk about design. There's been a lot of chatter out there about what this is going to look like, um, you know, on the other side, so to speak, with regard to seating bowls and um, premium and, you know, just throughout the whole facility. Uh, Jonathan, I thought I'd start with you. You um, jotted down a few of your thoughts on a blog on the Pendulum website. You talked to maybe 12 to 15 people across the industry, including sports, um, a season ticket holder for an NFL team, some sponsorship folks, um, as well as athletes. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about your findings and, and if there was any kind of a, a common theme there in terms of um, what folks will expect and, and how uh, what venue will look like in the future. Sure, sure. You know, the, I got the idea actually after you and I discussed your first piece, you know, early on. And I started thinking about, you know, from an operations standpoint, which is usually how that's the basis for our, our, our designs is, you know, how, do, how operationally is the, is the facility going to work. And so I just started asking people that I respected in the marketplace, you know, what their thoughts were. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the first thought was, you know, the unknown. I think, uh, you know, the, the relatively common thread amongst all, especially those in the business, was that, you know, sports is coming back. You know, so I posed that question, what if we don't get public assembly back? Uh, and, you know, I thought that everyone was fairly optimistic. You know, I think from a public standpoint, from a non, you know, or what we would call civilians, from a non, you know, operational standpoint, people are a lot more skeptical. And what I found is that people, you know, <laughs> initially just default to, well, sports is not really that essential. So it's kind of an interesting mix from, uh, you know, someone that's been around sports for quite some time. And, you know, I think it's a no brainer that people think that it's going to come back, you know, if they're in the operation standpoint, but I think people are defaulting to caution because first and foremost, we gotta, we gotta get a vaccine, you know, a, a verifiable and readily available vaccine. And then we gotta get testing, you know, we gotta get testing first, I think. So, I think, you know, that's what the public, I'm hearing from the public is a lot of concern about, you know, until we can get those two things, the rest is, you know, what we do in the seating bowl and what we do everywhere else is kind of uh, a foregone conclusion or are really not even worth thinking about right now. Right. Chris, you've been talking to a lot of folks out there. Um, what's your take on this as we kind of um, look to the future with venues? I took the... The same approach that Jonathan took, really, you know, we spent our careers focused in sports, you know, you know, we're not designing to our egos, we're working with people that, you know, own these teams, operate them, you know, that I think that's actually the fun is rolling up our sleeves and getting to know how they do their business. And so we, I don't think either of us are being presumptuous about what to do. We, we reach out to the folks that, that are there, they're on the front lines doing it. So my thing is I, I, reached out and just talked to Bob Jordan today, you know, met him back when he was, you know, before the American Airlines Center opened, right? He was involved in that and has gone on to be, you know, friend and client on other projects. And, you know, he, he's throwing stuff out there, but I think, you know, to, to add on what Jonathan said, you know, you have to have, there's a need to be a confidence. And my focus has been more on how do we roll out of this? And I don't, neither Jonathan or I are saying pack in the stadium. That's not the point. I think 
it's obviously quite the contrary because there's a lot of risk involved, right? There's the liability issues, mm -hmm. uh, you know, safety and health is paramount. So I think there's a new layer that's coming in, right? There's that, that health and wellness layer. And what does that look like? Is it manifest physically? Is it operationally? I think a lot of the operators that we're talking to, in some case, the operators are the owners, but basically people responsible for bringing thousands of people in are just saying, yeah, what, what do we do? They're looking at the process top to bottom. What's that arrival? What do they do when they go through our stadium? And, uh, you know, what I know that we can't deny what some of these folks are wondering. Can we actually host, you know, events? I mean, my personal opinion, what I'm hearing is, you can't, but you got to at least explore. And I think we've seen some things out there where people at least tried, but uh, my, my stance is how do we do it better? How do you do it safer? And, and uh, you know, I'm finding that there's some stuff that could be implemented that we already kind of have the technology and the know-how, right? So I don't, I'm not, I'm not looking for a silver bullet, but in fact, it's, it's a layered approach. So uh, lots of, lots of different directions, but it all starts back with the people that are in these venues. Right. Uh, we've seen a trend in terms of downsizing in general over the past five to 10 years, um, whether it's an NBA arena going from 20,000 to about 17,000 and, and then uh, in, in baseball um, going from maybe 45 to 48,000 seats down to 40. And then in some of the smaller markets like Oakland, you know, maybe about 32. And then Jonathan, you, you designed or you um, came up with an initial concept for a, a new Royals ballpark with 30,000 seats. So, I mean, kind of taking that one step further in terms of the groups of seats themselves, um, we've seen some diagrams out there. Jonathan, you, you've come up with a few yourself. Uh, how do you see that taking shape over the next 10 years? Well, I think, you know, as it relates to COVID-19, um, again, what we're seeing, if you look at what's being even rolled out with the cities, and we talked about this a little bit, the 10, 10, 10 scenario where, you know, 10 people, 10%, you know, in the little white paper that I had done in our blog, you know, the thought was that if, in fact, we get public assembly back in any form, obviously, when you look at following suit with what's going on in just general businesses, if it would be, you know, a reduction in the amount of people that are going to be able to be back in these bowls. So I think you're right. Generally speaking, from a design standpoint, we've been taught, we've been kind of, you know, preaching the less is more approach and, and having better quality seats uh, rather than being crammed in. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, the, the sports business model was jam as many people in there as you can. And it was all, you know, driven by the corporate dollar. That's changed over the past 10 years. You know, we're seeing, you know, mm -hmm focus on quality at less than at, and less on quantity. Right. Chris, your, your take. Uh, I, you know, it's great. I mean, I, I'm glad that I got to work with, with Jonathan for a time and in KC and, you know, what's great is I feed off a lot of his energy. I think that, you know, to sit back and say it's all been done or you got to do it like this or stick to a formula is in our style and our DNA. And I think that when you talk about the capacities in general, right, and we're not talking about reducing capacities to, to host games. We're talking in general where the market's trending is Jonathan hit it on the head. It's like make the quality, right? If it's about that visual experience, you know, it's the couch versus the stadium idea I think you, you got to do it. And, you know, we've seen that trend in the last 20 years to really, incrementally provide that neat little joie de vivre inside these venues that that makes people want to go you know I mean we were just in Chicago this summer and saw the changes at Wrigley right and in some ways I liked it in some ways I hated it and um, you know the, the I like that you have to have layers of amenity in our business and that's a unique case because there's a lot of history there but smaller actually I, and Jonathan's done some great things I mean in Hartford, I think that's a that's a great example. You know, you doing things different in a in what people are used to just sitting in a chair. You know, where where are we going next is definitely smaller. And regardless of where this pandemic is, is where's that that next shift? I think once we get to a comfort zone, once we're able to get people safely in and monitor it, and we have a, a better mindset moving forward, people will come back 
probably slowly, but they're going to come back. And I, I, I think the trend has always been, you know, you, you want to, you want to have a, a good time at the ball game, but you know, some people, there's other distractions in LA. We've got two of every, you know, major league team, except for, except for soccer these days. And so there's a lot of distractions. So that's a unique thing in LA, but you know, Kansas city or, or Des Moines or, you know, you know, Hartford, you know, there's, there's lots of different things, but the trend I think is, is make quality over quantity. Right. Have either of you talked to any teams about these, these new designs, you know, the social distancing, the gaps between seats. I mean, the revenue piece is obviously critical. You know, ticket sales are the, the backbone of, of any sports enterprise. I mean, uh, how, I mean, how do you kind of reach that happy medium where you're going to provide a, a safe environment, but, but be, yet be able to generate revenue? I, I think it's a moving target right now because there's so many, there's more questions than answers, right? I mean, until the CDC comes out with a guideline that we can all, you know, know where the, you know, where the starting point is, I think a lot of teams are just now, you know, speculating on what could be, I think obviously, I think more than anything, what's going to have an impact on their success is going to be uh, how well they implement a strategy that is visible to people that lets the public know that they're, that the teams are really interested in public health uh, and safety. Uh, but also I think, you know, it's about public perception. Again, you know, you look across the cross section of people that I talk to, you know, the people that were in the older uh, age category, made it very clear that until there's a vaccine readily available, I'm not coming back to a public event. So I think, you know, we got to factor that in because then you think about too the marketing strategy of a lot of these operators, um, you know, the premium amenities are typically consumed by those in a, you know, higher financial bracket. And those are typically those that are a little bit older. I think, you know, back to the point that Chris was making, I think we're starting to see a shift amongst savvy operators already to be thinking about what's the next 15 years look like when they're marketing to a, five, you know, now we're the, the mini plans, right? Are, were the thing 10 years ago and now they're continuing to, to be a, a good thing for these teams. If you're selling a five to seven year plan, are you really selling that to somebody that's 70 years old? Potentially. I'm not saying that, that those people have a, a short lifespan, but I think that the, the overall offering of amenities and seating and experience for people these days are starting to shift towards those in that 40-ish range and forward because those are the people that you can probably have another 15, 20 years of sales to. And so you got to start thinking about what kinds of things appeal to those people. You know, it's not, you know, a sardine can experience anymore it's a lot more spread out it's a lot more luxurious you know, think about how what we're doing and what we design a lot of things are influenced by culture by music by fashion by art these are the things that those people in that age range are excited about so we've got to start giving those things to the people even if ownership is doesn't understand or doesn't like it the reality is who you're selling to, they like it. And if you don't have it, you're not going to get re-ups on your season tickets. Right. Chris, um, it kind of ties into what we um, saw in Oakland at the Coliseum last fall um, with the subscription plan and Chris Giles and what he yeah. did out there in terms of, you know, you, you don't have a specific seat um, in the same place every game. I mean, you move around, you, your seat may be somewhere else depending on the demand and um, ticket sales for that game. I think maybe this will uh, play into that a little bit in terms of um, making sure you're, you've got enough distance between you and, and your, and, and, and the next fan. Um, well, I mean, yeah, and, sure. You know, it's funny. I, I, I pulled this out to show my son yesterday when we were there, I got this really cool stadium shirt there. Remember with the, yeah that yesterday a lot of t-shirt use but you know i think that we saw in in oakland what i like because they're training towards a ballpark and I, I know that you know jonathan and i both used to work at 360 back way back when uh and you know there were ideas that were kicked around when lou wolf 
was at the helm and, and really wanted to, you know, push a smaller ballpark and um, still does. I think with Dave Cavill is, is, has been, has kind of a laboratory there at Oklahoma Media Coliseum. I know Jonathan spent a lot of time there working on the arena back in the day too. Um, you know, the, the little stuff that they're able to kind of experiment with is proving that, Hey, you could do a different model. You know, that may not be a, you know, from a brick and mortar standpoint, they're creating and doing little neighborhoods. Right. Um, we, we sat in those, uh, I like to call them terrace tables, but you know, it's now been branded the four tops, but you know, that was a good experience. And, and to what degree you implement that and, and uh, what, what, what Chris laid out there and uh, the idea of, you know, you buy, you get some kind of a passport <clears throat> with the idea that, you don't get these games, but there's a set amount of games, right? People aren't going to 80 games or going to 40 games or they're going to 20 games. So the whole idea of that mini plan has been out there. So the next evolution of being able to get, get a space and hang out, we've all been dealing with. And to build off what, what uh, Jonathan said, and, you know, I, I agree with them. And I've been in his offices. They're great. I think he embodies that whole thing. That this is a lifestyle, especially when you're talking about sport. So I think to the, to what the, the Oakland uh, A's are looking at, they know their fan base. They actually have a pretty young fan base. They have a pretty engaged fan base. And as much as, you know, all of us here have been in that venue, uh, I'm, some people don't like it. It ranks on the lowest of many lists. It's, you know, probably the, the last one out the door. But uh, I like it for some certain charms. So the, the fact that they're taking those areas and experimenting with it, you know, they've created some value where there <clears throat> actually was none. Um, so I would love to be able to, I mean, I'm near two major league ballparks. I could be closer to Dodger stadium. Um, I grew up like in them and the angels lived in Chicago and it was just easier to get around in places like Chicago, but I don't go to the stadium as much. I'm on the road, but I'll, I'll hit, you know, 10, 12 baseball games in a season typically, but it's usually not my backyard and I'm not the typical user, but I like what the, what the, where Oakland is going in smaller seats, variety of product played it a lifestyle uh, i mean jonathan i don't know if you saw the the tree house but the area up there in the upper deck in in left field in oakland i thought they did pretty well with because it it's this the basic thing we all know people are going to game they're not buying a seat they're buying it you know i don't want to sound cliche the experience but they're just hanging out you know people just just chilling i think if we're evolving that direction um, which I actually even saw it before the, the Warriors moved because uh, going to the old, uh, what is it? Oh, I don't even know what, what it was last called, but Oakland Coliseum, right? It, what, what, what is the, what's the arena there? Oh, the arena? Oracle. Oracle? Yeah. yeah, I can never keep track. But the fact is, is that there were lots of, you know, 20 somethings hanging out, wearing the gear just to be in the building. And uh, so I think that, you know, we're, we're trending towards that. It's still an experience. We're going to get the fans back. Um, and, and the challenge really is the push has been for social spaces. I don't think we should be afraid of them, but what does that social space look like? Right. Yeah, Jonathan, I, I saw in your, um, your blog where one of your respondents said he believes those social gathering spaces will become more prevalent. Um, but at the same time, you've got to, make sure that everybody's safe. I mean, uh, is that, uh, talk a little bit about how that would um, adapt to your, to your plan for Royals ballpark. Well, I think just in general, uh, we're looking forward towards, you know, a, you, and I think you might've even had a conversation with one of our partners, uh, Pat Ryan, he's a James Beard nominated chef. We've been thinking heavily or quite a bit about how you, use or how we move along food service in sports facilities in general. And one of the things that we've been talking about since this, you know, COVID-19 has happened is, you know, let's talk about micro spaces. Like, you know, I think food service is going to change across the, the face of it is going to change across the board. And I think there's, there's general things about cleanliness and, you know, services. And that's something that you highlighted even comments that we in the discussion we had in, in your original piece but you know I think micro spaces you know even at a larger scale slightly but when you look at what we did at Memphis at AutoZone Park and we took you know eight suites and changed them into a billiards hall where it's a social gathering space uh, you know for 
a, a small group of people, small, when I'm saying there, I mean, we converted four suites into a space that accommodates about, you know, a hundred people, you know, mm -hmm. we can rethink that. But the idea that we take our old model of having defined walled spaces and break that down into micro spaces that now I think can be more heavily uh, trending towards a culinary experience. I think those are the kind of things that, that we'll be thinking about even more on how do we implement that in this next wave of things. Because at the end of the day, if you have less ability to bring masses in, you need to then up the quality of what you're providing for a smaller amount of people, right? So more value, less people. And I think that's the way that you start to normalize, you know, the financial model as we move forward. Right. Let's talk a little bit about getting into the ballpark, into the venue. Um, I wrote a, wrote a story this week about these walkthrough sanitizing machines. Uh, they're touching them in Hong Kong at a convention center. There's an outfit in Las Vegas that's working on their own version. Where do you see technology coming into play in terms of, of getting people into the facility safely? Well, I, I saw your piece. Um, I would say that that layer I talked about earlier, there's, you know, we had a security layer that was pretty obvious that here in the U.S. at post 9-11 that we added and it evolved. It, it, there was, you know, an initial rollout and, and we tweaked it along the way where the leagues have adapted their own policies, right? Different standards were pretty much if you're going in a, a big league venue, the screen right now consists of walk through metal detectors. You can only have so much gear of so much size, right? The, the, the bag requirements, the clear bags. So I think what we're going to see, at least as we roll out, we transition from, from COVID, um, get through it, whatever that timeline is, when it's safe. But I think that what we're seeing is there are some technologies out there. Like you said, whether it, is it, is it a, the spray booth, I'm going to call it, uh, is it thermal screening, which I know we've all talked about. Um, what was interesting in talking to Russ Simons and, and again, just reaching out, having that conversation what on, on people's minds and he's sitting there, they're about to open the big Inglewood stadium. You know, you got to think of that, you know, once you, you pull up in the car or drop off an Uber or get off the, the Metro, you're lining up. What, what's that first thing like? And you know, what I'm seeing is people are wondering what, what do we do? And I, I, I know maybe thermal screening is part of that. Can that be integrated with some of that security screening? Does it need to be separate? And it looks like it needs to be separate to be efficient. One of the things I think it's training just based on the input uh, that I'm getting, uh, talking to Aaron Rush up at, at even Golden One Center in Sacramento, Scott Jenkins in, in Atlanta with the Falcons, is, you know, you got to get people safely in these buildings and create that uh, assurance that you're, we're, we're, you know, not just putting on theater, but we're actually doing the best that we can. So uh, the idea that, Workers are at least going to wear PPE masks, but maybe there's health screening. And, and what we're seeing, contract, contact tracing is a little controversial, but as we get testing, uh, as we get better treatment, as we get a vaccination, I think it's going to be, we're going to be known. How do you do that? And it's already out there in, in the Asia Pacific, whether it's in Korea or China or Taiwan, you, you get a, like a QR type code that identifies to you. And, you know, it's, it's green, it's yellow, it's red. And if you're green, you go maybe to a, these side uh, pop-up tents, you go in line, you know, the, the idea of, uh, of the term I liked and, and Dan Donovan pointed out who have done a lot of security stuff with Dan and Dan's, you know, hands-on on big events. He said, look, there's a social responsibility. We all, we, we all need to take that top to bottom, you know, uh, and, the, and the, the people going there with a ticket need to have that first and foremost going in. They also need to understand that, hey, if, if you don't necessarily meet these guidelines and we have to communicate what those are going to be maybe it's going to be if you trigger a 99.5 uh, temp on a thermal scan we're going to divert you and, and, and maybe revoke that ticket or, or refund your ticket um, and again that's a that's a, a threshold um, and, and maybe from there you then you also have to have your QR code scan and once you're clear maybe you get a wristband then you get in security but I think there's a layer there and uh, we, we some places it's easier to do because you got the big plaza like up in Vegas, you know, T-Mobile Arena, you got a huge plaza. I love that experience. Uh, flows in real nicely, but we're all packed in. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it, it go to Pico Park, you know, Peco Park, you're right there on the street. You know, I think the Cubs kind of 
mitigated some of that with with obviously the recent uh, expansions and pushing the boundaries of what Wrigley is, but sometimes you don't have the space. Fenway, um, you know, to extend like Jonathan had to deal with that also in, in Hartford and other places. I mean, Dayton, I mean, so that layer, I think of health screening is going to be there. Uh, Don, I think it's going to back in with security and, and that's, I think you got to see it at the front door and, and maybe we, we throw out a bunch of, you know, hand cleaners everywhere. Uh, or, or maybe we can put in wash stations like you see at the festivals. But I think things like that are going to be more prevalent, whether it's, you know, in the, the small town markets or your, your major venues. I think, yeah. the success of, I think the success for teams is going to be a lot on, again, we get back to public perception, right? I mean, we're going to have to rethink the way, or we're going to have to be retrained as far as what, we anticipate our experience to be at public assembly. I mean, you think about it, when you go to the airport, nobody likes being pulled aside for random checking, but <laughs> pretty much know that, and especially as much as I travel, I probably get, you know, picked up, you know, once, uh, once or twice a month, right? Mm -hmm. Just because if I'm bouncing between legs or whatever, you're going to get randomly screened. So I, I think when you think about, you know, what's next for these facilities, I think that the teams that are, are really savvy are going to have to really do a really good job of helping people to understand what to expect. Um, because now you get pulled aside in a, at, for a random screening at, a, at an airport, you know, you don't like it, but it's no big deal. I think, you know, you don't expect that at a facility. I mean, when's the last time you were pulled out of line at a, at a sport, at a sporting event uh, before you even get inside for a random screening? So that, mm -hmm. that it's going to have to be an education and, and, a, and a, you know, really a, a good public relations uh, campaign, I think, for all these teams to, to, to really pull it off well. Right. And this, some of this stuff isn't cheap either. The, um, this group out of Vegas, they're quoting, I think, 25,000 um, box <laughs> for, for one of these cubes that you just kind of walk through and get sprayed. And, and I mean, you don't know if it's, actually uh working or you know it's uh, working as intended so i yeah and i didn't i guess i didn't answer that directly i, I don't think that that's a solution i think that uh it's a it's a it's a dangerous way, way to go uh from you know even if it's proven safe uh i don't think that there's a, a, the effectiveness is going to be there when you know really we're, what we're learning about right now dealing where we are in, in, in our pandemic and where we need to be there's an in-between space but if people aren't talking about getting an in-between field what's the point of going through this these misters uh, it's good that it's there I, I get why why it can be there but i think uh it's a solution in really globally but definitely in the u.s I, I don't think that's going to be effective efficient uh, whether for cost or operation i think it's, it's the wrong way to go yeah. Well, again, we've got to go back to, you know, we st we're still waiting on the CDC to, to tell us. I, I mean, I think the thermal thing that was mentioned, I mean, certainly that's, you know, again, something that people have been using to help screen. But, you know, I, I think we, there's a lot that we need to know before we can even get. And that was one of the points of someone that I spoke with, uh, you know, that, that is way up in the food chain at, at, for a Major League Baseball you know, it's like, let's talk about tailgating. Let's talk about security. Let's talk about all of <laughs> before you get to your seat and then back out to go right. try beer or go try to buy food or anything like that. So, you know, it's a valid point that, that maybe all the talk about seating bowls is, is, is a bit presumptuous, but the reality is we know that or we can just about guess that there's probably going to be a limitation on how many people can be in a facility and there will be some form of social distancing post, you know, the green light to, to go back into facilities. So, you know, presumptuous maybe, but the idea is, you know, start thinking about those things now, but obviously you can't start selling product until we know, until we have a benchmark on, on where to start and then where to go from there. Right. Chris, um, your firm um, does a lot of convention center work. Yep. How do you things? How do you see things changing in that market? Uh, depending on the city, these are giant halls, just you know, hundreds of thousands of square feet. Um, you know, you would think you'd have enough room to 
to protect each other and be safe. But um, how, where is that? Where is that head in the future? Well, it's a, I think to go back to a point I made earlier about you know the things the lesson we learned post nine eleven. Uh, convention centers are still have been struggling with you know how do you secure access. Um, there's so many points of entry. Part of that's dependent because there are large volume spaces, you know, and upwards of a million to three million square feet. Um, it's it's a tough thing to manage even in a small building. So uh, I think from a security level, they they haven't quite answered, it, and maybe this pushes everyone in the direction is how do how do we manage that? You know, clearly there's going to be an op the operational impacts are more manpower. Clearly. Uh, it's going to take a little bit longer. We're going to need to have some forgiveness, but that convention center experience it. It's uh, you know they're asking the same questions, and so it hasn't been vetted. I mean, we haven't come with a with. There's no silver bullet anyway, but what's what's that implementation? Is, is it's a good question because you know there's a, I was just in San Diego. There's a sea of doors going all the way down the building, and uh, you know you can still lock those buildings, but when you have a convention you know, full of three, 5,000 people, you know, managing that controlled access is tough. And how do you screen? And if we are going to screen, what does that look like in the convention center? Which is why, you know, Vegas right now is very interesting. This extreme box that you mentioned that kind of the spray boost, they do a lot of interesting products. And uh, so I think it's a, it's, it's a good thing to explore. Um, but a lot of that was based on, you know, the idea that you've got guys on, construction sites out there somewhere reports were that they're <clears throat> being sprayed either coming into the site or out of the site or both with some kind of bleach water mixture you know i don't even know that's effective or safe um so i think that the idea of you if you do that in a mass requirement in, in like a convention center ah that, that that slows you down but we haven't haven't fixed the security problem yet but now we're gonna need to understand how can we efficiently and safely queue people in through a building screen if you need to and go in but right now unless you're going into an exhibit space there's a limited screening right if you're, you're in the lobby you're in the pre-function spaces you may be headed towards a meeting room they may check your badge but there's been very limited screening when you're going into the same exhibition hall and um, that's something you got to change i mean i i what that is, again, I think it's going to come to some type of crowd mass screening. You're going to have to have visible changes. And I, I think, again, it's a lot of personal responsibility and maybe some kind of a, a scanning techniques. If you're asymptomatic, what, what we're looking at now, what does it matter if you're, uh, you know, 80, uh, what is it, 98.7, you're good. I don't know what the deal uh, is, the, the, the solution is, Don, and I think that the convention center market is in the same place that the sports market, that the concert market is in. Um, but there needs to be a, a better screening process, I think. And, and it's going to be similar to what I mentioned about what we're doing to get into a, a stadium. Okay, very good. Well, gentlemen, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, anything else I'm missing here? Or do you want to leave us with a with a closing um, statement, closing argument here in terms of <laughs> the future of, of public assembly and, and how everybody's going to be safe. Well, I guess what I'll say is I think that, you know, again, with me, I like conversations. I like to start conversations and start thinking. You know, if you look at all of the uh, sports icons that we love, if you look at all of the musicians that we love, most of those people are comfortable with being vulnerable and they're relentless and they're passionate about what they do. I think, you know, as we look forward, the these franchises and the organizations that are comfortable with, you know, not taking chances, but I think being a thought leader in you know, being proactive. Uh, again, we need a, obviously we need a, a benchmark. We need a starting point from the CDC, but I think those that are really thinking ahead and looking at, you know, uh, what's coming next, I think those are the people that we're going to see really flourish and, and we're going to see really, you know, well, uh, you know, post COVID-19. Uh, and just to add on to that, I think what, what we're finding is some of the solutions we're going to have, we're going to have to, think creatively, but some of the technologies in place, whether it's 
thermal screening or using, you know, like in, in food service, we didn't get into it, but I think the idea of pre-ordering, which everyone's doing on mobile, we're doing it on Uber Eats and Grubhub, mm -hmm. uh, rethinking that concession experience where maybe you have a smaller menu uh, package goods where you, you either have it uh, run down to you through an kind of in-seat service. Maybe our vendors become servers, um, runners, uh, but you kind of re rethink how our, our contact points are, right? And, uh, and and what I love is that we didn't kind of get deep into it, but you know, in some buildings, especially the enclosed arenas, you know, it. What about our our air handling systems? And you know, not to to bog that down, but those are other things that that our building folks are looking at. You know, do you do negative ionization? Do you do some sort of, of HEPA filtration? You do you know, UVB and all that type of things, you need to look at that. And it may or may not make an impact. I think at the end of the day, we need to get to a point where we're better control where people can get together. Because remember, what we're faced with is we don't want people congregating and coming to contact. We need to avoid that. How do you do that? Even if you social distance in the stadium when someone gets up to have a beer and someone's coming back from the restroom and you're passing down a 48-inch aisle. Mm -hmm. Even if you have a mask on. I mean, there's just, we got we to gotta think of that big picture we hear, I think Jonathan said it, I'll echo it. These operators, these owners, they're thinking about that. What can we do? Is it stupid to space people out? Maybe, but you got to look at that as a business case. I think you're finding it's not a good business case uh, to, to do something like that, but let's, it's going to drive us to innovation and, and hopefully a new awareness. And, and I, I do think that, uh, the, like I said, the technology is there. So hopefully these Wi-Fi and cloud-based systems are going to be able to kind of withhold it. Maybe you'll find out it's just like going to, to uh, little Caesar's pizza, right? You can order your pizza, go to the, the hot box, their, their, their pizza portal and nobody touches it, but you and the guy who put it in there. So. Right. Okay, guys. Well, thanks very much. Jonathan Cole from Pendulum Studio and Chris Lambert from TBS Design. Appreciate it. Great discussion. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tom. See you, John. Yeah.